so let's see. So I've known Ken for many years now. He's a, a fellow ion trapper. And um, I'll give you a little bit of, of the context with which I know Ken, because I, I think it, it's actually it's sort of fun. Um, so he, he started off his career as a theoretical chemist. And he was at Berkeley in the group of Brigido Whaley. And uh, while he was there on the way to graduating in 2003, he intersected with lots of people, including um, his first PRL was with David Bacon. And he had interesting interactions with David DiVincenzo and Daniel Lidar and, and many others who are, are now, you know, I think pulled him into the quantum information theory sort of uh, uh, context. And he's, he's continued to make contributions in both chemistry and quantum information uh, throughout his entire career. Um, so I think the first that I heard of heard Ken's name and then David Lybrand's name actually was in a 2006 paper where uh, in follow-up to a proposal by the ion storage group in Boulder, uh, lo and behold, this theory group that he joined at MIT uh, demonstrated a surface electrode ion trap. And this was, this was an amazing trap that uh, not only could trap ions, um, but it could trap chains of ions. They could take the ions and they could split them and combine them, have them move across different zones of a quantum CCD. And I remember being just like, wow, here's this theory group. Where did they get this all of a sudden? And I think uh, Ken was one of their uh, the secret uh, superpowers because he was both a theorist and an experimentalist. And he actually got some of his experimental chops while working with Dan Stamperkern on building a Alfie Pritchard trap back in Berkeley. So this, the, the trick to their making this trap is this ion trap. It was the first surface electrode ion trap uh, is that they were trapping tiny polystyrene balls uh, at um, you know, about a 10th of a tor, I think. And uh, I was just really impressed with this. Uh, they were able to go from zero to 60 on, on learning a lot about ion traps very quickly. And uh, they were very courageous in just jumping into this new field um, and, and making a paper that I think was really a uh, very sort of uh, a neat demonstration of what of what the future might hold for for ion trap uh, in a scalable sense. So he then later uh, published a paper where they had trapped strontium ions uh, in a trap. So he got his real ion trap uh, chops at that point. And uh, over time, he uh, this is in the Ike Schwang group. Uh, sorry, I failed to mention that. And he joined. Uh, uh, Georgia Tech chemistry on a tenure track in a position in, I think, 2008, and continued to work on chemistry there and theory related to uh, quantum error correction. And by 2016, he had started his collaboration with the Monroe Group at UMD, and he became the sort of go-to guy for learning how to do both uh, error correction to fix errors in gates with composite pulses, and then how to do two qubit, arbitrary two qubit interactions using uh, particular pulse laser sequences that would decouple the sort of spectator ion motion by the end of the gate. And he's just been really, I think, a key member of that quantum computing effort since then. And uh, so I hope, I, I know that Ken is gonna give a great talk and uh, I think it will be as probably as, as weighty and massive as those 10 to the seven, minus 17 kilogram ions you first tracked. So. Great. Thank you, Joe. Thank Thanks. You. Yeah. Yes. It's far, it's far too kind of an introduction. Uh, uh, I guess I'll say, I just want, I want to just say one thing about when we were working with Ike is uh, we just didn't have any biases. So, you know, when you're an atomic physicist, you're always like, don't break vacuum, right? We got to keep this trap. We just didn't know any better. And the only time it went wrong was the first time we trapped in this strontium surface trap. We sent the paper out to PRA. We showed laser ablation of strontium. Totally disassembled the system. Totally took it apart. <laughs> got rid of the trap. Got rid of everything. <laughs> Reviewers right back. Could you do these few more measurements? <laughs> and we're like, uh, uh. Anyway, we talked our way out of it. But uh, it was, yeah. Ever since then, I tell my students we have to at least wait for the reviewers. Then we can take things apart. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk uh, today most about quantum error correction, kind of um, what I'm excited about. I, I do want to say that uh, we have a lot of fun things going on in the lab with molecular ions and also ion trap experiments. And 
if anybody wants to talk to me about that later, just email me, contact me anytime. Um, I also will say that, uh, yeah, so we're, I can go backwards maybe. Nope. Um, yeah, anyway, so, so we just started the Duke Quantum Center. It's great. We don't live on Duke campus with the beautiful Gothic Chapel. We live downtown in the Chesterfield warehouse, which is the first automated cigarette factory in the US. Um, we, yeah, okay, there we go. Yeah, uh, then I should also say that I um, advise for INQ, which you guys know is just down the street. All right, so this is kind of dumb. It's like when I'm on the bus and somebody's like, what do you work on? I say, quantum computers. They say, well, how many qubits do you have now? And I'm always like, not enough. And so we all know we need more qubits and less error. Um, and why? So sometimes, you know, I'd like to just break Bitcoin because I'm tired of my undergrads talking about blockchain all the time. That's probably my main motivation right now. Uh, my my long-term motivation has been to simulate molecules. I really did get into quantum computing from a chemist perspective, which is, can we actually speed up chemistry? And then of course, there's these physics models and we know they cost a lot. So, um, so let's just pick some specific quantum algorithm. So this chemistry algorithm of trying to understand how nitrogen ice turns nitrogen into ammonia, there's this estimate from Microsoft and ETH that, that it takes about 10 to the 15 quantum gates. And there've been many improvements since then. And I would guess that this number is probably closer to 10 to the 12 now. And I, I do want to point out that these are just a few places where a lot of this work's going on, but a lot of great work's happened here at Maryland. And I do think one of our thrusts for the introduced Institute for Robust Quantum Simulation, I'm actually further pushing this. I think I'm, I'm very excited to see where it goes. Nevertheless, we can think about how am I going to get across this gap from where I am now to where I want to be. Um, I'm by nature kind of a Hamiltonian sort of guy. So I want to use Hamiltonians to do quantum control and make this error less. But we all know that there's kind of a limit. You're going to reach some kind of spontaneous emission limit, some kind of environmental noise limit. Uh, we can do better, but we can't get that far. Um, of course, as part of this uh, institute, we can try to improve the algorithm. But if you look at really hard algorithms um, that require high precision, which is sort of what these chemistry algorithms have, there's actually kind of a counting limit of how good it can get. You sort of know you can't push it too much further or you lose the precision that you really want it. So the standard um, kind of approach is we just really need the more qubits, many, many, many more qubits um, with slightly better error. And then we just do quantum error correction all the way down to the problem we want to get to. So of course we should do all of these things. Um, so when we think about scaling hardware, I kind of uh, say there's like a DMOP approach and a DCMP approach. So on the DMOP side, we're all happy because uh, every cube is the same by nature. Environment's kind of easy to understand. And the challenge is how can we control and confine individually large numbers of these qubits. And so for ion chaps specifically, I uh, recently wrote this review paper with John Chirini and Jeremy Sage and Hartman Hefner, where we kind of talk about like, what would our ideal future ion trap look like? What are kind of materials issues to get there? And uh, we of course would love some help. On the second side, um, the condensed matter physics side, you know, they always say, well, you know, every cube is the same up to manufacturing defects, it's okay. There's a lot of stronger coupling to environment. And then the claim is always, you can print as many as you can fit on a chip. So this is an example of a, of a device from HRL uh, where they have printed one, two, three, four, five, six uh, spins, which form two qubits. Um, and it's an amazing, actually it's an amazing device with like um, three dimensional feed throughs, et cetera, but it points to the challenge of printing. And then I also want to say for um, any theorists, graduate theorists in the audience who feel like their theories disconnected from experiments, say, the, the thing they use here is an exchange only interaction, which the grad students I worked with in 1999 showed you could build a quantum computer with that. And this is the first time people can show a two qubit gate, which is basically 20 years later, right? So sometimes it'll take time. So theorists, 
the experimenters will eventually catch up. Don't don't fret. <laughs> um, okay, so we've been working on uh, with this ion chain quantum computer. Uh, the idea is, you know, it's not completely scalable. We can have a chain of ions we can connect. We have the 32 channel AOM, which enables us to do individual addressing. We get these traps from Sandia, which are uh, in one sense a miracle, and then we get them in a FedEx box and they work. And in another sense, like a nightmare, because when they don't work, <laughs> it's like, what do you, uh, how do you get the next one? Um, so, so I'll be talking about some, of, mostly our, some work from this logic collaboration, um, and then our NSF stack uh, collaboration. Um, and then we, we, we do some related work with the DOE with this QScout proposal. And in this new KLCI, uh, which I'm a member with, if people don't know here at Maryland, uh, you know, we hope to use these devices towards simulation. Okay, so usually when I talk to um, the error correction skeptics, I'd say, yeah, they say, well, I heard you need a thousand qubits per logical qubit. And I always ask them like, what, like, where did you get that number? Who told you it was a thousand? Why do you believe it? And um, the number basically comes from this paper by uh, Fowler, Mary Antonio, Martinez, and Cleland, which is three experimentalists and one theorist. And it's sort of like surface code for superconducting experimentalists. That's the point of this paper. And in that paper, they basically make an argument that leads to this thousand to 10,000 number. And it goes like this. So we know the logical error rate is gonna equal some constant times the physical error rate divided by the threshold. And for an error correcting code, which uses n physical qubits to encode one logical qubit with a distance d, it basically fails as d over two. And when you take this logarithm, uh, you get a nice description of like how this error will scale. You see that it mostly depends on this distance. And the thing which is bad about the surface code is, um, even though the surface code uses L squared qubits, the distance is only L. And so we, we get this square root of half. And then if you pick some reasonable error rate, like this 10 to the minus 14, 15, that we would need to do that nitrogenase, you get out a thousand. So, oh, sorry. Now, the other thing is you'd say, okay, what I really would like to do is I, I, you know, as a Hamiltonian person, I would like to control my error of my system and make the physical error lower. But that actually just turns out to be a logarithmic gain. So, so if your error is already at a certain rate, it is better to just make a bigger system um, and you get less gain by actually making the world's best gain. Which is, yeah, bad for me. Cause I like to try to make the world's best gates. Uh, so, so we've been doing um, a lot of work um, to reduce the error. Uh, so for example, um, when I was working with Ike, uh, Aram Harrow and I invented these uh, arbitrary accurate composite pulses, of which we only use basically the first order, <laughs> uh, which you can think of as, instead of doing a single rotation by theta, you do a single rotation and then two wraps all the way around the world. And when you do that, um, the kind of residual error at the end here ends up going like the area of this triangle. So one thing um, I'm not gonna talk about much, but I'm broadly interested in is how can we use our characterization tools to understand better what control sequence to use? So in our system at Duke, uh, this is these, these experimental data is joint with Jungsan Kim's group. This is my student, Bichan, who just became a postdoc with Jeff Thompson at uh, Princeton. Uh, you know, our individual gate errors are quite good. They're pushing three nines anyway. We know that we have a slow laser intensity fluctuation. So using this SK1 pulse actually improves the fidelity and also you see reduces the spread. Um, but if I take these gates and I feed it into um, Sandia's gate set tomography package pigsty and I ask it, will this work? It actually tells me no. And it's not really fair because pigsty expects that every gate is the same. And what I'm taking advantage of in this quantum control is I know that I have a slowly drifting laser intensity. So it can't make this connection, but it does make it, uh, I don't know, it's kind of a weird chicken egg problem about how can we, how can we uh, get 
the most reliable information about what's wrong with our gates so that we can then fix it. Um, so for us, our usual problem are these two qubit gates. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work on frequency modulated two qubit gates. Um, this particular results come from this, uh, this paper again with Jung Song Kim's group, um, where we have these discrete frequency modulated gates. Uh, what you need to do for the ion trap two qubit ion, yeah, ion trap two qubit gate is you use the motion as an intermediary to entangle between the two ions. And um, the uh, to have no residual entanglement in the motion, you actually have these have to have these loop back to the center of their positions in phase space. These are the four modes, and we were able to get pretty good gates um, around ninety nine. Yeah, 99.4, 99.6 nowadays. Um, I'm fond of these two trajectories because to me, this one looks kind of like a bear with a small hat. And this is like a little honeybee, but that's just my view. Um, we're continuing to do this all the time, trying to figure out how to take advantage of correlations in the noise to make these gates better. Um, so what I like about ion trap, well, actually what I like about physics generically is you could say, well, why? how can there be any more better two qubit gates people working on this for a decade two decades but the thing is there are always new ideas and always better approaches so um the a gtri they basically said well what if we do one of these geometric phase gates but instead of using a hyperfine qubit or a zeeming qubit we'll actually use um an optical qubit and what's remarkable is they proposed it in 2021 so I'm not Kenton Brown. That's my doppelganger, Kenton. <laughs> um, and they, uh, yeah, they proposed it in 2021. And then they did it in 2021. And they currently have the best two qubit gate in the world, which is remarkable, right? What have what, what, what the rest of us been doing for 20 years? Uh, you know, it's great. It gets us further below the threshold. In the end, these things will be kind of limited by spontaneous emission around 10 to the minus 6. And then... Um, I don't know why, but I, I guess pandemics made me a little bit sentimental. So the first author on this experimental paper is my first PhD student. And now I realize I need to get them to sign a paper to say they will never make better gates than me once they leave the lab. <laughs> <laughs> That's my, my goal. Anyway, so yeah, so Craig Clark. Um, so, so when we think about scaling up, you know, I think there's kind of different ion trap opinions it loosely falls into like, you make the longest chain you can possibly make, um, which I think of as sort of, you know, Maryland Innsbruck approach, or you go with the two qubit chain, so you have the most control, which I think of as kind of um, Oxford or NIST kind of approach. Um, and of course, the reality is somewhere in the middle. And so another thing which has been nice about as, the, as these, these systems get more complex is I've had a lot of, um, great interactions with quantum, with, with classical computer architects. So this work is with Margaret Martinozzi and her student, uh, Prakash Morali, basically looked at a bunch of, imagine you had 64 qubits, which is more than we have, and said, how should I split them up into these CCD architectures and what length chains do I need? And what's surprising is it ends up depending on everything. It depends on the application. It depends on this connectivity of how you assume the CCD is connected up. And then even depends on the two qubit gate times, like whether you take advantage of kind of like um, ability to run ion gates faster if they're local, or if you run them in a way where they're just basically constant speed. Uh, it's quite fascinating. Okay, so I think in the last couple of years, there've been a lot of uh, great work on doing quantum error correction um, now. Um, I think it's still small. And I think part of the reason it's small is it's kind of unforgiving. You run the experiment and you get a zero or a one. There's no sense of averaging. Every one you get is a loss and you can't necessarily post select. Um, we can do a little bit. So, you know, so with Chris's group, um, we worked on this bacon short code, which I'll talk about in a lot more detail. Uh, Google has shown for this classical code that they're able to make very large, long distance classical codes. Um, you can see, yeah, I'll just say this is their plot of uh, measurement and two qubit gate fidelity and single qubit gate fidelity uh, over the device. And you see for them, actually, measurement is kind of their, their weak spot. 
Uh, the Honeywell Quantinium Group um, were able to show repeated error correction on this um, steam code, color code, though not quite below the threshold. And then um, at Yale, they were able to show one of these GKP codes. And it's really amazing. So none of these are where we want to be. But all of them, the fact that so many people are now at the point where we're pushing that boundary, uh, to me, is remarkable. Okay, so I just, uh, oh man, you can't see it. Uh, <laughs> imagine there are octagons <laughs> between, those, <laughs> between those diamonds. Anyway, that's the tile in my house, right? It's a very common tile, of octagons and then these, these squares. And um, the problem is I just do error correction all the time. So to me, it just looks like a color code. So I walk into the, yeah, I walk into the bathroom, like, oh, it's color code, color code. And then you think, okay, I'll go to breakfast. And the problem at breakfast is that these things also remind me of error correcting codes. So maybe you've got these vegan bacon strips um, and we can think of a vegan bacon shore. And then I can think of my waffle there and I have you know, some blueberries and bananas. And I just immediately try to connect them up to like make a, a you know, correct, correct whatever error is lying around there. Um, for, for the experts in the audience, I know that there's no logical qubit on this kind of waffle. And for the non-experts, it's a good homework challenge to think about why there is no logical qubit on the waffle. Um, yeah. So I really miss visiting in-person things. And so um, I was telling Joe, I really love coming to in-person colloquium, but all the stories I have about why I love it are kind of bad because I love to go to people's labs and learn about what doesn't work. You see people's talks, they tell you what works, right? Uh, but sometimes you need to know like what not to buy, how to get around some kind of thing. And I feel like for me, like in-person colloquium has been really great for that. So for in-person conferences, um, <laughs> the thing which is, I think to me, which is totally lost in this current world of virtual meetings. And I think the hybrid March meeting was awful if anyone else, went or didn't go, um, is that I always get the most out of like the hike or the coffee, or in this case of this Aspen conference on a ski chair. And so Cody Jones on the ski chair was like, oh, you know, the rotated surface code is just a gauge fixing of the bacon short code. And when he said that to me, I immediately knew it was tr true because I like, but I just did not like put those, I just never put that sentence together. And so for the last few years, um, we've been just doing a lot of work basically off of this chairlift conversation. So if you think about a classical error correcting code, it's best to like compare it to a ferromagnetic Ising model. So I have a ferromagnetic Ising model. I basically have two ground states. Everybody agrees, everybody disagrees. And then correction, um, like an error, you know, creates like a domain wall. And then we can correct by basically bringing these domain walls together. And that leads to the repetition curve. So there's another spin model in two dimensions, the compass model, where you imagine the direction of the, of the spin-spin coupling depends on the direction of the bond along the compass. And so we can take this compass model and we can build these compass codes. So um, what's interesting is the following code. So, so so sure is the first quantum error correcting code, which is just two repetition codes stuck together. A repetition code that fixes one direction, and then it concatenate it into a second repetition code. Dave Bacon um, basically saw that you could start at this compass model and map it to this, uh, he called, just called it a compass code, uh, which Ella Ferris and Cross then called Bacon Shore. And it basically symmetrizes this. And then what Cody told me on the, on the ski lift was that actually, if I put these gauges together in the right way, I actually get out the rotated surface code. Um, so the you know, original planar surface code of boundaries from Robin Gataev and this rotated version from uh, Bombin and Delgado. So um, the Bacon Shore code is kind of great because you have very few checks. So I have this L squared, number of qubits, but I only have two L checks. Uh, there's no threshold with increasing L. So if I make it bigger and bigger and bigger, eventually breaks down. Um, however, 
uh, it does have the best concatenation threshold. So if you want to make concatenated codes, that would be the way to go. And then Ted Yoder has this nice result to show how to do um, uh, toffly like control control Z gate on these things. Uh, surface code we're all we're probably more familiar with. Um, we have basically L squared checks, but they're all very small. These good thresholds and local checks make it very promising. And then there's cool, there's recently really cool ideas on how to fix bias noise from the Sydney group um, by making it symmetric. So instead of having X type checks and Z types checks, just having X, Z, Z, X checks. Okay, so um, thinking about breakfast, uh, I was just curious about, okay, what's the problem with the bacon, sh bacon short code? Well, the problem with the bacon short code is that it's really easy for the error, which we represent as this pirate ship, to go from one side to the other. And so I was like, well, surface code, you can kind of think is like these waffle icebergs that appear in the middle of the bacon. And of course, it makes it harder to sail from one side to the other. And so I was basically really curious about like, well, how much of this, how much of the, how many of these icebergs do we need? And so uh, working with, um, yeah, my, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so my grad student, Yuan Li, Daniel Miller, who is an undergrad at, um, at, blah, at the University of Dusseldorf, where I was doing a sabbatical in um, <laughs> molecular ion work, and he just stopped by to talk to me about quantum error correction. And Mike Newman, who's a postdoc, is now at Google. Um, Yi Kai Wu, who, who worked with Lu Ming Duan, and myself, we basically were looked at this whole sketch of ways to do things. And we find that basically you need kind of a constant amount of surface code. So as long as there's a constant amount of surface code, you get back the threshold. So what I like about compass codes is they're really nice in terms of, of, of doing the error correction now. And in fact, on the qubit side, um, most of the work, well, yeah, most of the work has been done with this or with the C713 code. So a few years back, um, working with Norbert, uh, we were able to uh, look at a quantum error detecting code. And what I really like about this is we basically sacrifice one of these qubits. So we use the 412 code, or we use the 422 code, but we just sacrifice a qubit. And we found that the, the fault tolerant procedure of error detection finally beat the physical error rate, which is amazing. <laughs> And uh, the second thing we found was that the, the error model um, wasn't crazy. So error correction skeptics on the theory side always say, well, some crazy error is gonna show up out of nowhere and ruin everything. Um, but as far as we could tell, things look fine. So then people have shown this with IBM. IBM shown it with devi IBM devices. Outsiders have used the IBM devices. And then ETH Zurich um, on their own superconducting device showed multiple rounds of stabilization. Similarly, um, we have been able to do, uh, uh, so I'm gonna talk more about the Bacon Shore stuff. Um, but I wanted to point out this, um, this nice work uh, that my group did with Norbert's group, looking at exactly this thing about how the Shore code itself doesn't have a threshold with increasing L. So it means there's some distance, in this case five, which is kind of like the optimal size. And then going further, it goes down. But this kind of emulation work, I think, is really, really quite nice. Um, and nice to see you know. <laughs> uh, the, the IBM basically adopted our compass code models to make these heavy hex type codes, which are indeed something between Bacon Shore and surface codes. And then recently, and then, yeah, they just recently, sh this nice paper came out this month. And then um, Andreas Walrup's group was able to do the Surface 17 uh, code here. This is your chip. This is, uh, you can't, it's too small to see, I know, but they basically have slightly better measurements than, um, they have significantly better measurements than Google, um, but quite a bit worse two qubit gates. Okay. All right. So, um, I'm going to talk. I'm actually going to talk about the theory behind um, this experiment we did with Chris's group. Uh, so, of course, there's this 32 channel uh, device with the HOA2 trap and 32 channels of PMT. Um, we're able to encode these nine qubits plus their ancillary qubits into this ion chain. 
uh, and then measure these logical operations. Um, and yeah, it was really excellent work. So I just wanna talk a little bit about how it works. So the first thing is, um, in a, from an error, quantum error corrections perspective, when you measure these stabilizers and fault tolerance, uh, you worry that the, the doing the measurement actually generates more errors than you would like, right? So it spreads. And so what we were able to do was basically pick a specific pattern, which actually comes from the underlying compass code, uh, to, to, to measure these large weight stabilizers fault tolerantly. It's actually really, it was very surprising to me, uh, but even though the gauges are all fixed, somehow that gauge structure, I don't know, like there's a memory of it in the code, and we can actually fault tolerantly measure stabilizers of arbitrary size. And uh, my student, Shilin Wang, uh, I was like, okay. So again, each this picture you wanna think of is every little square, if, if there's a square, it's like the surface code, if there are these long rectangles, it's like the Bacon Shore code. And so this is like partly like Bacon Shore, partly like, um, you know, these waffles in the middle. And so I asked Shilin to just calculate it for all kinds of things. And uh, Shilin, of course, is like, that's nuts because <laughs> I need to make decoders for all of these things. And so he came up with a new way to do air, uh, a very fast, algorithmically fast way to do surface code decoding called weighted union fine. And then in this, this follow-up paper, we applied it to the surface code. So if you, it's a, it's a really great compromise between the accuracy of minimum weight perfect matching and the speed of union fine decoding, which was from Delfoss and Nickerson. Um, the next thing is, uh, <laughs> so when I talk to my superconductor friends, they're like, we just want longer T1 and T2. And then I talk to my ion trap friends and they're like, I've never heard of T1. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, T2, <laughs> T2 is pretty long. Uh, you know, in our experiment where we don't do that much work, T2 is half a second. We do some work, it gets to two seconds. Our friends in China have T2s of like uh, 10 hours now, right? So, so, so for ion traps, when we think about error correction, I'm mostly interested about fixing gates. And then my um, controls, side, Hamiltonian side comes back all the time. And so I know most of my gates end up being this like laser intensity problem. Like that's my, that's the thing I have the least control of. Laser frequency is great. Phase stability, pretty good. Intensity, it's just hard to have the intensity of the ion exactly what you want. So what that leads to is kind of over and under rotations. And so we imagine this, uh, uh, this kind of model which goes between kind of a stochastic random noise of applying this gate or kind of a small over rotation to the gate you're applying. And when we put that into the context of error correction, you can imagine you have a control and this is the, the, the check you want to measure and you split it into two checks, which you think of as a left rotating check and a right rotating check. And um, it's hard to do generically but again, for Bacon Shore, the gauge structure saves us. It tells us that we can do, we can basically pair up the gauge control knots to be plus and minus Molmer Sorensen gates. And that actually leads to some suppression. So numerically, we kind of see this uh, remarkable, like we just, this is like a prepare measure kind of circuit. Um, it's kind of amazing because of that, um, yeah, because of that hidden symmetry, so to speak, and our ability to take advantage of the coherence of the error, if the gates become more unitary and less stochastic, which to a normal error correction theorist is the worst, it actually gets better for Bacon Shore and kind of flat for the surface code. Um, a similar point has to do with correlated errors. So this is kind of, um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, sometimes when I look at this result, I'm a little bit like embarrassed, like why didn't we do this earlier? <laughs> so the thing is from an error correction perspective, each of these, so this, this um, ZZ check, right? We think of being ferromagnetic. If I think about it being anti-ferromagnetic, 
From a typical error correcting coding perspective, there is no difference because a random poly Z error doesn't care if it's ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic. But when I write out the states and you show it to any atomic physicist and you say, which of these states will dephase faster? Everyone will say the one on the top because we know GHZ states are better for um, dephasing with these magnetic fields. And so what we did is by switching to this code, um, again, with Chris's group, we see again, a huge improvement in the ramsey frim contrast of these sort of logical qubits um, uh, just, just by changing this gauge. And so this, I think, is actually, there's a broader message here, which is that in every physical system, the errors are not poly errors. And so because of that, given that you basically have two to the n minus one possible subspaces you could pick as your code, for your machine, there'll be one best subspace. And uh, I know how to do it for this transversal field, but you should think about it for whatever your, your errors are. Um, I also note that uh, my colleague, Robert Calderbank at Duke with his students um, have a way to kind of expand this to a broader set of like, uh, take, take advantage of this of a broader set of codes to help you solve this problem of coherent noise. Um, yeah, I just wanna harp on this point about physical errors versus theory errors. Uh, so yeah, so actually this paper um, is, yeah, I believe acknowledges this robust quantum simulation QLCI because uh, it includes Shruti and Jeff are both part of our larger team. Um, so when you do error correction, the problem is error occurs and you don't know where it happens. So erasure seems like the worst error because you throw the qubit away. But if you know which qubit threw away, it is actually better than keeping the qubit and suffering T2 um, because there's so much information in knowing the location. And so uh, what they were able, so, so Jeff came up with a scheme using um, Rydberg atoms in which the dominant error, like, uh, like over 90% or 95% leads to detectable errors. Assuming you can detect the creation of the cytoterbium ion, and this one's pretty easy. You can detect when you fall out of your Rydberg manifold. Um, and then here's the gain. So we see that the, this is if there is no, if this if we just had the poly noise and now we switch them to erasure, we see the threshold is increased, the point where the distances cross. And we see for any specific error, there's a pretty significant reduction. And then of course, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty significant reduction in the logical error. And that's outside of your textbook quantum error correction, okay? So, so, so I really, I highly recommend all of us think about how can we turn our errors into erasures. Um, so to reach larger distances, you know, there's uh, different ideas. This is a, uh, um, from, from Winnie Hensinger's group with Austin Fowler, they just imagine like, I, it's almost a football field size CCD ion trap, which is pretty cool. Uh, there's this idea of connecting things with photonic interlinks. Um, I do think with ion traps, again, I said in this review paper, we have a huge wish list of how we wanna get photons in and out. Um, problem with standing here is I can't see the time. How am I doing? <laughs> okay, great. I feel better about that. Um, yeah, and so, you know, we would like to be able to have on-chip everything, de detection, laser integration, et cetera. Um, so I just wanna get back to this, this the code side. <laughs> so uh, there's a really nice paper by Latinsky where he tries to figure out like, what is the architecture which would optimize um, the surface code? And what you see is there's a huge trade-off between the time it takes to do your um, algorithm, seven hours versus 45 minutes, and the number of qubits you need. But in some sense, this, this jump here is just a factor of three. Um, so yeah, it, it pays off, right? If qubits were cheap, it would totally pay off. And so I think that's pretty interesting. Um, however, uh, at the beginning, I mentioned this thing about the distance going like the length. And so I really like this image from um, this paper by Kovalev and Prodko on hyperbicycle codes. 
So these are the same layouts of physical qubits. On the right is the surface code with its usual weight for checks. It's on a torus, and so there are two logical qubits, and these are the logical operators. On the left, same layout of qubits, but now I've made my check operators not exactly local. They, they have like the weight for part from before, and then I have these two kind of distant qubits that have to somehow interact. And what happens is I get a huge hit in distance, right? 15 to five. But now I have actually 98 logical qubits. And so the weak, like one of the weaknesses of the surface code is that from a coding theory perspective, it's a bad code. You use a ton of physical qubits to just make one logical qubit. When you, when you think about codes we use, you know, for our cell phones, et cetera, we, 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 can, we can code the rate much higher. Um, and I think, that, anyway, again, I think this graphic nicely points it out. Um, Daniel Gottesman has been pointing this out for a long time. Uh, the, you know, this nice paper in 2013, he explains how to get to sort of constant overhead. Um, I think, you know, of course, surface code, it's not like, uh, right, quantum computing is like this intersection of information theory and physics. And so we have to like, you know, <laughs> we have to compromise on both sides, right? So surface code is so great because everything is local and you can imagine building your local device, very comfortable to physics. Um, and so in this recent paper uh, from Microsoft group, they say, well, what if things were mostly two-dimensional and there's only like a thin layer of non-two-dimensionality, a thin layer of non-locality. Um, and when they do this, they get to a kind of an asymptotic limit of 50 qubits per logical qubit, which is way better than a thousand. Um, and I don't, and I, I don't think any of us can say what the fundamental limit is. So in the last, yeah, I don't, yeah, last couple of years, there's really been, um, and I'm sorry, I just have references with no comments on what they're about, but it's just like a bloom of like theoretical results that basically give constructive methods to make codes that have n qubits, have a fraction of n logical qubits and a fraction of n distance. Now, the thing is they really require this modular um, architecture. And I was happy to see, you know, you can see his lab today talking about this conversion of blue photons to red photons to build networks. And I really think we need to get to these, these, um, these kind of modular things. This is an example from, you know, Oxford's group of doing entanglement with ions. Uh, here are two examples, which are basically the same concept, which is you have these transmon qubits connected by resonators. Uh, this one is, you know, in one dilution fridge. This one is like 20 meters <laughs> down the hallway, right? Uh, but I think move. I think to take advantage of these um, these low parity density check codes, we really need to uh, we really need to move to these modules. So anyway, I hope that uh, I can convince more of you to work on quantum error correction. I know it's hard. It's unforgiving. I feel like sometimes, um, yeah. I mean, to be honest, I think like simulation. Ex experiments are more forgiving because they're about averages and they're about unknown parameters and you have some like space and quantum error correction is like, well, how many times did you get a one? Like 95, that's it. That's, that's all you can report. Uh, but I think it's cool. I think there's a lot of important physics questions on how if we make systems that enable us to do these finite rate codes. And so I think it's worth uh, pushing forward on that. Um, and then finally, I cannot stress enough how when we move to more reasonable physical error, like more physically motivated error models, there's a lot of potential savings. Um, so I just wanted to say, since I, yeah, I only really talked about quantum error correction theory mostly today. So just some of my recent graduates. Uh, so Natalie, um, I didn't talk about her work, but she worked on leakage in quantum error correction and she's now at Continuum. And she's actually on that PRX paper showing repeated Steen quantum error correction. Uh, Miwan Lee is now at IBM. He's on that paper showing uh, these hex codes. Mike Newman is now at Google. He's on the paper showing re long repetition codes. 
Dripto got to Google a little bit after that. Uh, Narayanan's uh, Robert Calderbank student currently on the faculty job market. Catherine's graduating now and trying to decide where to go for, for grad school. Um, and then Sheelan will be looking for postdocs in the fall. So if you need a good error correction person. And then I'm very thankful for my key collaborators, Jung Sang, Norbert, Chris, Fred, and Margaret. Um, and then I just want to say we do a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> uh, this is the group pre-pandemic. Um, I need to take a new photo. Like, yeah, half these people are gone. But I'm really interested in um, using the tools of uh, ion trap quantum computing to understand more about cold molecular ions. Um, actually, based on a discussion I had with Joe one time, Joe was like, we could have droplets of liquid in the, in, instead of having polystyrene droplets, we have droplets of liquid. Um, and then uh, we were able to demonstrate that you could put a cell inside that liquid and actually sort living cells. Um, and yeah, and anyway, thanks for all the funding from NSF, the Army, IRPA, and Department of Energy. And I'll take all questions. <laughs> So uh, the big picture coming from your chemistry background, you said at the beginning, you know, one of the long-term goals is simulating molecules. So I see a lot of press now about AI solving this problem. So what, what's your view on? I mean, are you competing with AI, or who gets there first? Or, uh, okay, so no, well, it's not it's it's not hype. I mean, like the AI with the protein folding stuff is pretty impressive. Am I? Um, people I know who do folding, you know, they have some complaints, of course, but they're definitely impressed. Um, I think my own experience with machine learning um, is I don't think it does really well at high precision. It does really well at like kind of 1%, maybe 0.1%. Um, and when you think about, so, so yeah, yeah, I have a really kind of weird specific example. So. Uh, my lab measured the first uh, row vibration, uh, yeah, row vibronic spectra of calcium H+. Uh, when we did that, we got this really great sequence of vibrational lines. And our friend who is a theorist said the, the, the bottom one should be 700 wave numbers below the, the, the line. And so our theory friend was like, look, it's calcium and hydrogen. That's super easy. You guys have missed this line. Okay. And then my experimental uh, PCHEM friends, actually at Emory, Mike Heaven, was like, you can never trust the theorist. <laughs> this bottom line has to be the zero line. And so then we had to do the experiment where we um, deuterated the molecule. And then when you have calcium H plus and calcium D plus, you actually have incommensurate ladders. And then you can identify where the bottom of the ladder is. If you had a quantum computer, you could fix that. And so my, 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 my theory friend, David Sherl at Georgia Tech is really quite good. He was really mad that it was off by 700 wave numbers. That's how far it was off. So he did a whole level of theory higher than usual and it was still off by 350 wave numbers. So this is like, I don't, this is not a good way to raise money for quantum computing, but if you could build a quantum computer that could calculate accurately the values of small molecules, uh, the spectroscopy of small molecules, you would change astrochemistry. Because when we look into space, there are all these lines that we know are molecules and our current calculations are so bad, we can't tell you what they are. We have to do the experiments. So anyway, so I don't think AI will get to that precision. That's my main point. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. No, 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 no. There's no fundamental limit. Um, Could you repeat the, the question, please? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, so the first question is about whether AI will, will make quantum computers obsolete. I think the answer is no. Uh, second question is about um, this, the, this uh, Raman gate 
or I mean, this 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 gate on the optical qubit using um, basically a Stark shift. Uh, why can't we do the same thing with um, like a normal hyperfine qubit? Um, it just turns out that you get, um, yeah, I, it sounds dumb. It just comes down somehow to the level structure, uh, but you just get the ability to really push this thing very fast on these two levels. Um, and then you suffer, unlike, a, you know, unlike our magnetically insensitive hyperfine states, you have to worry about this frequency fluctuation, but you can do the gates so fast that that sort of washes that part out. But I don't, there's no, the, the best, um, best hyperfine gates are very close to that, 99.92 or something. Yeah. 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 Um, all right, so this question has to do with um, uh, errors and the difference between coherent errors and stochastic errors. So, um, so one of the really important parts about quantum error correction is that any error process, because poly matrices form a complete set of bases, any error process, well, <laughs> except for leakage and erasure, we forget about that, uh, <laughs> Can be, rent, can be always written as a sum of these poly errors. So if you can fix poly errors, you can fix anything. Um, so the normal error model uh, we learn and we teach looks like this, where there's you know, probability of nothing happens, probability that the error happens. Um, and this is basically the twirled approximation of a coherent error. And so the, the difference, the physical difference really is the time scale of correlation. What is a twirl approximation? Oh yeah, sorry, okay. So in a poly twirl approximation, um, you basically do something like, uh, it looks like a spin echo kind of sequence and you um, allows you to get rid of the coherent phases and goes twirls it to like a regular poly channel. Um, it's one of the reasons why randomized benchmarking often gives you good results because randomized benchmarking effectively twirls the channel. Um, yeah, so, so it ends up being about correlations and time that dis distinguish these two things. So uh, like the default result, the default mindset of, as a quantum error correction version, your default mindset should be, I don't wanna worry about this. I will twirl it away because then I gain back my theoretical guarantees that it will work. Um, from a quantum control perspective, it is way better it's correlated because then you can actually fix it without having to go to error correction. And there's some tension there. And I, I think the result is you, right, you wanna combine these things together. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think my question was a bit more high. I guess like, for non-complicated errors, which we just put together code space, yeah, okay, so, so the question is about how can we actually diagnose these coherent errors, um, in particular, um, the relationship between how they connect different code spaces. So we're not doing, it's not a logical coherent error, right? It's a coherent error locally on the physical qubits. And so what that creates, unlike the normal case, is a superposition over all of these code spaces. Now you measure. And so the beauty of quantum error correction to me is that when I measure, that actually pushes me into one code space. Then I can still move it back like normal. And then the thing which is different um, is that uh, <laughs> for, for, for a random error, when I move it back, I will still fail sometimes, right? So I, so I end up with a state here, which is say 97% of the state I want, 3% wrong. If the error is coherent, when I move it back, I've actually wrote, I've rotated my logical state just a little bit. 
But error correction still works because that rotation is small. Yeah, so I should have said it's, uh, I probably misspoke, but it's actually constant in the length. And so, um, so basically, um, Uh, yeah, um, this is the best one. So, so imagine I have a Z, to, to have a logical error, I need a string of errors that gets from one edge to the other edge. So let's say I have um, a blue string and then it turns on these orange checks. So, so there are more possible ch checks um, as, I, as I go across when I have the surface code, then when I have bacon short. But it turns out I only need a number of checks um, that, that the, yeah, that, that's the part which is weird. It's kind of where the analogy breaks down. So the problem is on, this, on, the, on the bacon shore, I can't really see, like I can't distinguish um, all the errors that happen in one column, they all look the same. And when I add more of the checks on the surface code, I start to break that distinction up. And so in some sense, I, um, yeah, you can kind of think I reduce the entropy. And so all I need to do is to get that, if, if, if I think of, um, yeah, if I think of this decoding problem as like a free energy question of like, what's the energy barrier versus like how much entropy there is, um, by adding more of these checks, I basically reduce the entropy part, um, which allows me to be stable. In the same way, there's no space transition in a 1D Ising model. So this Bacon Shore is like a 1D Ising model. It's not, it's, not, it's not a perfect analogy for a bunch of reasons, but that's roughly how I think about it. Uh, hi, Ken. This is Bill Phillips. Hey, Bill. Um, I'd like to return to the, the question that, that Steve asked, or rather your answer to it, uh, having to do with uh, this um, rather dramatic failure of the theory for, uh, I think it was calcium hydride ions. Yeah. Uh, and sure enough, you know, if, if, you know, as somebody who doesn't know how to do these calculations, I look at something and say calcium hydride, 700 wave numbers how could how could you have an error that big and when you work really really hard and you reduce that error by a factor of two it seems like it, it seems amazing so could you give us a little bit more insight into why it's so hard to do what would appear to be a relatively simple calculation i mean usually the answer is something like you haven't gotten the electron correlation right but uh which i guess is where the quantum computer comes in but could you enlighten us a little bit more about that <laughs> Well, it's exactly you haven't got the electron correlation right. Uh, so the so the so the so so what's amazing is um, you know when we do this experiment, we're also able to measure like uh, the vibrational coefficient for the ground electronic state and the excited electronic state, right? And those numbers are basically constant over all of this theory of progression. <laughs> like this binding part is somehow easy. So then the difference between the ground state and electronic state, basically they're like zero offset. Um, that number is good to, uh, I just lost it, what's four, 400 nanometers um, in terahertz is, anybody? 800 terahertz? Yeah, let's, yeah, let's, let's pretend, yeah. Let's pretend it's 800 terahertz. And then so uh, 350 wave numbers is like a terahertz. And so it's already like a 0.2% accurate calculation. It's really quite good, but it's not good enough to, to identify things.
Okay, well, if if there isn't another question in the room, I've got I've got another one here. Um, you said that that uh, from an experimental point of view, one of your biggest bugaboos was um, the the laser intensity. Yes. Uh, and so, could you just say a little bit more about what the problem is with the laser intensity? I mean, obviously, you lock it, you know. So. So what's what what's what's left over that's causing you the problems? Well, so okay, so for these particular experiments, we address the ion um, using a, a micromirror that steers the laser, right? So there's a question of like, is that repositioning perfect? And so even just it not being perfect and like shifting a little bit on the Gaussian. Um, and then the next question is really like the yeah, so that so so we have some place where, where we lock and try to stabilize the intensity, right? But that place is not the ion. And um, I guess I want to point out that it's <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's quite good. <laughs> it's quite good, right? It's like an error of ten to the minus three in fidelity, which is a uh, basically like a 1% kind of intensity change. Um, but we just can't, somehow that's the knob, which, which we see it slowly drift due to like, you know, temperature change in the lab, moves things just a little bit, moves index of refraction a little bit. Um, yeah, but I, I'm happy for any suggestions on how to, to make it more stable. Well, what I'm guessing, what, what I'm wondering is, for example, you, I mean, it seems perfectly reasonable that if you've got uh, a micromere assembly that uh, that maybe there's a little bit of hysteresis or some non some stochastic non reproducibility, maybe there's a little bit of drift. Um, so when you say that, is that actually a guess, or have you measured that that that's the problem? <laughs> Um, it's, it's a guess. I mean, we, I guess we've not done the, we could do the experiment where we, um, put the micromere onto a CCD the distance away. It should be from the ion and then watch the pixels change. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't know what the, I don't know what the real number is there. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>